We begin today with someone who is in the midst of both of those issues, Congressman Jared Moskowitz of South Florida. Great to have you with us, Congressman, this morning. I know we were having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Taking a deep breath and uh, ready to chat. Hi, Glenna. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks. I'm glad, and I'm glad I can hear you well. So. I want to start out with what I guess is a little bit of breaking news. Um, the, the war in Israel really has an uptick in anti-Semitic incidents as one of the fallouts locally. And your congregation at your own synagogue uh, just in the last couple of hours overnight has experienced exactly that. What can you tell us about that? Weigh in on that for us for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Glenna, one of the things that has been most disturbing about what's going on in the Middle East in a foreign policy issue in a war between Hamas and Israel is the, that it has turned to anti, it's turned to Jewish hatred around the world, but very much so in this country. It, re, it has reminded, quite frankly, the Jewish community why Israel was created and has reminded the Jewish community why appeasement can never be something that is considered. Everyone in the streets that is marching, that's holding signs that say, gas the Jews, kill the Jews, bring Hitler back, Hitler was right. All over social media and all in the streets are reminding the Jewish community that this is not about uh, a ceasefire or humanitarian aid. It is, a, it is exactly about what Hamas tried to, to do, which is to uh, end uh, Jewish people, is what they're committed to, and it's what we saw in the atrocities. Um, what happened at my congregation, just you know, two miles from where I live, uh, is you know a bunch of kids in get in ski masks, going uh, up to the congregation saying "kill the Jews," something they probably saw on TikTok because it's a cool thing to want to have mass genocide of an entire religion, which is something obviously the Jewish community has heard before, which is why it's so, uh, which is why it's so concerning. Yeah. You know, in in Congress, the support for Israel is not 100 percent universal, but almost universal, bipartisan, bicameral. Um, and yet we are watching in the Biden administration as well or watching as the air offensive continues and the images of what the Gazan civilians are enduring there. The you hear the narrative uh, nationwide begin to erode in that support. I know you and your colleagues are working on resolutions and support. What more can Congress do to to set the narrative? Well, look, one, you know, Congress is, can pass the aid package that President Biden has requested uh, so that there can be both support for Israel and in their campaign to eliminate Hamas and humanitarian aid uh, to the uh, innocent Palestinians in, in Gaza. I support both of those things. I support uh, Israel being able to eliminate Hamas, and I support humanitarian aid for the Palestinians in Gaza. And I think not only can you do both, I think you must do both. Uh, I think that's tremendously important. You know, as far as the, the narrative, you know, uh, of what's going on in the war, I mean, this was predictable. I, I said it was going to happen. Many other people said it would happen in the first couple of days because Hamas committed, I mean, just unbelievable atrocities for the world to see. But once that event was over and we transitioned to Israel's response, the images of what happened in Israel are off the television screen, right? And now it's only the images of what's happening in Gaza. And so just like anything else, in the media narrative, we can only focus on what is being beamed into our brains. Uh, and we forget just days or weeks ago of why what happened, what Hamas did is why we're seeing in Gaza. Hamas is responsible for what happens in Gaza at the moment. It's there. It, it's that's why Israel is there. That being said, that doesn't mean Israel doesn't have responsibility to limit civilian casualties, uh, which is what they're doing as much as you can in an active war. Uh, and so, look, it is a horrible situation. Uh, there is no doubt uh, that Hamas uh, has taken the entire Gaza Strip hostage, in addition to the hostages that they're holding underneath the ground. Uh, Americans, kids, babies, elderly. In the tunnels. Um, in the tunnels. I mean, it just, yeah. it, 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 it's a horrible situation. No one should be celebrating 
war. And no one should be cheering Israel's response. It is unfortunately a necessary response because Hamas has proven that they can no longer live side by side with Israel. Congressman, I want to talk a little bit about the other huge news uh, nationwide that we're talking about that you have really such ties to as we approach in Lewiston, Maine, 600 mass shootings this year. Uh, you, of course, an alum of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High, and since then, hundreds of mass shootings, even since that upheaval in our own community gave us a firsthand look at what being victims of mass shootings look like. The Maine shooting victims now up on our screen. You have a colleague, Jared Golden from Maine, who is a staunch gun rights advocate who now has sort of done an about face and very publicly said he would like to see assault rifles banned. You in the State House, right after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas massacre, really pushed through uh, in a bipartisan way some unprecedented gun law in this state. Do you foresee this Maine mass shooting doing the same nationally at all? Well, listen, you know, you know, I'm someone who, as you know, Glenna, you know, went through what Jared is going through uh, in Maine. He, you know, has visited the crime scenes. I mean, I went to my high school where 17 people went to school that day and didn't come home. Uh, I then went to the reunification center, which I'm sure he's doing, where they kept the families of you know, the parents of the kids they couldn't reach on their cell phones um, and hoping, hoping to hear something, hoping they were in a hospital somewhere, but not in the building. Uh, and then I watched as law enforcement and the FBI came in and notified family one by one, you know, what had happened to their kid, where they were in the building uh, or their spouse, because uh, we lost teachers, uh, teachers that day as well. Um, I didn't hear crying. I heard screaming. It, it still haunts me to this day. And then I attended funeral after funeral. I was driving past funerals to go to other funerals, 17 funerals going on almost simultaneously. Then the makeshift memorials that were built and the mental health impact that it has, not just on the families, but on um, loved ones, on friends, on folks that were there to witness it and on the community. And so you cannot, and I say this all the time, and it's it's how I, I really believe we passed the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School Safety Bill. You cannot witness one of these things and come out the same person, right? You, you're just different. So do you, do you see this? Do you foresee this being the catalyst for what? Some kind of change nationally, support for universal background checks? Oh, look, I, I don't know, Glenn. Washington is so broken. OK, we, we can we can barely, you know, agree that this, the House should have a speaker. OK, so, I mean, it, you know, everyone has seen the dysfunction of the last nine months, 10 months in Congress in the last couple of weeks. I mean, it's there. There's questions whether we can handle big, complicated issues like this. Look, it was very clear in Florida how to handle it. Right. There was lots of stuff I wanted that I wasn't going to get. And there was lots of stuff they my Republican colleagues across the aisle didn't want to do that. I had to get them comfortable with. We raised the age to 21. We did red flags here, three day waiting periods, hundreds of millions of dollars for mental health school resource officers uh, so that there would be more protection for students in the schools. Uh, and, and so there's a lot we can do. We can do school safety. We can do mental health policy. You know, I really think red flag laws is something that we should be doing at a national level. I'm for an assault weapons ban, but the votes don't exist for that yeah. right now. Yeah. And so can we do, can we all agree that mentally ill people shouldn't have weapons. If we cannot agree that mentally ill people should not have weapons, then no, Glenna, nothing ever is gonna happen. I mean, if someone is literally in a mental institution, like this gentleman was, and then he could go out and buy a gun and unlimited ammunition and body armor if he wanted, um, if we can't agree that maybe, perhaps, he shouldn't be able to go get a weapon of war, because he's shown, I don't know, that he's hearing voices in his head. Maybe he is, maybe that's where we should draw the line and say that's probably a law that might mitigate the situation. Of course, we're not going to stop all mass shootings. I'm tired of that argument. Oh, laws don't stop. It's not going to stop all this, but we can mitigate it. And every life that we save is still a life that we save. We passed that law here, Glenna. It was bipartisan. Republicans led on it. Not a single Republican lost their election over that law. And there are no 
chanting in the streets, no protests, that their Second Amendment rights are being abridged. We have a Second Amendment in this country. We have to respect that. We but we also have to be reasonable. Yes, and we look forward to seeing that kind of passion on the floor of Congress. We know we will. Jared Moskowitz, great to see you. Great to have you here this morning. And we will absolutely continue this very soon. Thanks, Glenn.